So yes, what is what is a BBC Micro? Oh, transition work. That's a BBC Micro, uh, an 8-bit machine. In 1981, the BBC decided that they wanted to do a series of programs, that is, TV programs, on computers, and they wanted to um, uh, sort of have it as a school project type thing where they could have shows on the, on on uh, on BBC One that you could then show in class and teach pe teach kids about computers. But at the time, there wasn't really an affordable and sort of programmable computer you could get. So they decided that they would sponsor a, a company called Acorn to get, create such a computer, a relatively affordable, although it turned out to be still pretty damn expensive, a few hundred pounds back way back when in eighty one, um, and um, and so it was in almost every school around that time, in sort of the, the mid late eighties, even up to the early nineties. Excuse me, and um, looked a bit like this. Um, it was loaded off of tape, like cassette tape, or you could put a, a disk drive on the side of it as well for extra expense. But most people had, I guess, by this time, most people would have bought a disk drive. It was just unfathomable to load everything off of tape, but. Um, but the main thing that the BBC Micro gave us, other than an entire generation from the UK who, who grew up and knew what assembly was and knew what, how to program in BASIC, which was like the default um, thing you'd get when you turn the thing on, was this game, which is Elite, which I believe most people now know about. Um, it was a wireframe um, ship flying around in space, 3D shooter, Back and trading game back when nobody had told the guys who wrote it that it would be totally impossible to write a 3D game on a two megahertz, eight bit computer, and it's it's awesome. And there's a whole bunch of cool things that it's doing to actually even to work here, which we'll go into a little bit later on. Um, it's not my favourite game on the Beeb though. My favourite game is this one, which is Exile, which is a kind of flying around uh, puzzle puzzle based game. Uh, with a, an awesome physics engine, with an awesome kind of like operating system of like um, management system for like the elements that are in the world. It's, it's brilliant, you know. You, and the thing about this was it was ultimately hackable. Once people had worked out how it worked, they actually hacked into it and you were able to like change the gun that you had to shoot out like aliens instead of the bullets it would normally spawn. And, uh, and then it was really fun to sort of like shoot thousands of aliens out and go, well, this is more aliens than it can deal with. What would happen? And what would happen is it, they would start just popping off and exploding. But they didn't just disappear. It wasn't just like it overflowed some 16 element array of like how many a uh, aliens are available. It actually exploded them with little dots. So they'd obviously thought about this case. And, and anyway, it's, it's an awesome game. It's an absolute tour de force of what you can do on a two, two megahertz machine. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to get this emulator working so that I could play it again. In a web browser, um, why 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 do I have such a, a strong affinity with the BBC Micro other than like playing my old games? Well, it was my first professional job was to write stuff for the BBC Micro. So this is in eighty, no, this is ninety one, I think. I meant to check this before. Nineteen ninety one. It's a magazine, um, and this is the, the oh no, what does that do? I pressed the laser pointer, and now, and now I've been punished. No, no, no. Okay, we'll have that. That's fine. All right, we're gonna. It'll be in non full screen mode, but as long as it's gonna go to the next one. Oh crap! I broke it, didn't I? What is it? Ah, okay. Anyway, yes, you, here is it's a type in from a magazine. Um, they used to pay like fifty pounds, which is quite a lot of money when you're when you're fifteen, in 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 the nineties, to to sort of put in uh, give them type in name uh, type in programs. And this one was one of ones that I did, although they misspelt my name here. Uh, me and my my friend Richard, who who still work who still write, writes um, BBC Micro demos even now, like thirty years on. He's awesome. Um, but yeah, we had a whole spate of things where we would write columns for this magazine and type in programs and eventually going to the disk. And at one stage, we had, um, we had a, like a, a five part um, full game type in section spec'd out. But at that point, 
just before we started doing it, the magazine decided they were going to stop covering the BBC Micro and they moved on to the next generation of, of machines, which was, which was a shame because that would have been awesome. But anyway, uh, what's inside one of these things? So I think I've already said before. Oh, sorry, I've just realized now that the uh, my view has just disappeared. Let's try this one more time. One more time. Yeah, no, 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 my view has like the next slide and all sorts of stuff like that as well. But yeah, it's not working, so I'm going to give up on it and I'm just going to point at the screen. Uh, so yeah, as I said, we've got a 2 megahertz 6502. So pretty much the same processor as the Apple II had, although my understanding is the Apple II had only ran it at 1 megahertz because that was as fast as all the peripherals would run. So it was clocked at the same speed as everything else inside the Apple II, like the lowest common denominator. On the Beeb, they sort of turbo clocked it, which I believe was an add-on. I'm looking over here because you were nodding a minute ago about Apple IIs or not. Right, okay, okay. But there, there was like a, an add-in for the Apple II where you kind of put a daughter board which doubled the speed for the processor, um, but then halved it again to talk to the peripherals on the outside world. And that trick is effectively what the BBC Micro did all the time. It ran the, the CPU at 2 megahertz and all of the other sort of main parts of uh, the, the system, the video controller, the sound, the tape and floppy disk. Um, this is the analog to digital converter, the ADC there, and a few other sort of cool peripherals that it had on it. It kind of had like PIO pins as well, so you could do quite a lot of uh, hardware trickery with it in its just, just straight out of the box. And cool stuff like the manual would have the pinouts in the back and the circuit diagrams of everything, which was just totally awesome. And, oh yeah, one thing to mention about this is that the, the co-author of Elite, the game that we saw a, a bit about, the space trading game, is, um, is the guy behind the Raspberry Pi, and there is no, there's, there, there's no coincidence there. He also has very healthy memories of like being given a BBC Micro, which was ultimately hackable, ultimately replaceable, had all these PIO pins on it, so you could drive hardware projects and stuff, and he wanted that to, to, to recapture that in the Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi is a very deliberate... Um, mimic, modern day mimic of this computer, except with a small increase in speed. Uh, yes, so it had 32K of RAM and 32K of ROM, and the video hardware was pretty simple. There were two sort of video chips in it. One produced just a character map display so that you could just have a, you know, A to Z, 0 to 9, and a few other sort of control char characters called the Teletext, which is what this dreadful font that I'm using the, the, uh, uh, the titles are in. Is, is the Teletext character map, and I think it was used as well on a lot of uh, like early BBSs would use this, this character map, and um, there was actually a service on the, um, the BBC provided on t for TVs called Teletext, which is where it gets its name from, where in the vertical flyback of the, the screen as they were sending out the regular TV pictures, they encoded like about one, 700 bytes worth of extra data which included an entire character map display, and then they would cycle through like a thousand of those over like a, a thousand frames or so. And then if your TV was so equi equipped, you could access these pages of information, like a really, really early gopher type thing. Um, and use the same encoding. So we have this Teletext screen map, but also there was a second chip in there which did this sort of regular um, uh, bitmap mode with sort of slightly f funky formatting in terms of the way the pixels go. but you could configure it in all sorts of different ways, but ultimately there were sort of like several mainly used modes. You either have like a high resolution monochrome mode of 640 by 256, high resolution, <laughs> uh, or, or the, uh, the sort of game mode would be 160 pixels by 256. It's pretty awesome. Um, in eight, a full eight colors, I'm quite staggering. From a palette of 16, though. Uh, that's what it looks like inside. Pretty much everything is a discrete component, which is awesome, again, from an emulator's point of view, because as I'm starting to learn more about how everything fits together, I'm emulating individual chips and, and, and their interactions with each other rather than like a functional level implementation. So the process is this middle one here. Uh, there's a couple of the, the IO, process, uh, IO sort of helper chips here, and I think these two are the ROMs, and then everything else is like RAM and funny other bits and bobs, uh, and some sort of, there's a couple of ULAs that it doesn't really matter for now. Let's move on and we'll talk about what actually happens inside of 6502. So um, 6502 is a pretty simple but, but, um, but powerful little chip. As I said, it can run at like 2 megahertz. It's simple in as much as it only has five registers. 
And of those five registers, only one of them is actually really sort of a general purpose register. These are 8-bit registers. The A register is the accumulator. You, that's the sort of like the default destination register where any kind of results will go. Um, and it's the only one that you can do adding and subtracting with. Uh, you get two index registers, again, 8-bit index registers, X and Y. Uh, a flags register, P, which is not really something you can normally refer to as a register. It's just getting the various bits in it are set based on conditions that happen in the code, like comparisons or overflows or things like that. Um, and then a stack pointer. So you have a, an 8-bit stack pointer. So you've got at most 256 bytes of stack to use. And the stack was fixed to be at a particular position in RAM, like the, 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 the top 8 bits of the 16-bit address were always 0, 2. So uh, your stack effectively would, was forced to run from address 200 to 2FF in memory. And then you have one 16-bit register, which is not really a register, but it's the program counter. It's just where it's going to execute the next instruction from. So there's not a lot there. Let's just take a look. Uh, it's not aren't as cool colors now I think about it. So here's a sort of a, a smattering of some of the instructions that the 6502 had. Uh, you would like be able to load and store to the A register, LDA, STA. You could also load into those index registers directly, LDX. You could transfer from register to register, TAX and TXA. It goes, um, TAX is transfer A to X. Uh, push is PH. Uh, so FA is push A, PLA is pull A. Compare, obviously, does a comparison implicitly with the accumulator only. You can add and subtract, which, again, is the accumulator. Uh, you can do, modify the flags. You can clear them and set them, depending on um, what you like. So like CLC here and SEC, clear carry and set the carry. Un uh, branching is done by a, a jump, which allows you to jump to any 16-bit address. So it's an absolute address. Or any of the BEQ or type things here, which is branch if equal, branch if not equal, branch if carry clear. Those are only 8-bit um, operands, so that you could only conditionally branch to within 256 bytes of where you currently were, which meant that a lot of the time there was like trampolining code where you would sort of branch to somewhere which would then do a jump to where you really wanted to go conditionally. Um, and then for, for subroutines, there's a JSR and an RTS, which are jump to subroutine and return from subroutine, which would also like push the current program counter before going off to that address and pop it back again and return. So that's pretty much all the instructions you had. There's no multiply, there's no divide. Um, there are some shift operations I haven't put on there, but not very much more than that. And certainly no multi-bit multi, multi -bit shifts. If you want to shift four times, you have to do it for, do a single shift four times. Then each instruction could be, um, has effectively multiple addressing modes. So you could use that instruction in different ways. So here, these are all the LDA instruction and all the different ways that you can use it. So you can load, the top one is uh, the, the pound or the hash. I'm going to say hash. The hash, the LDA hash 32 is the immediate value. So you can't quite see it up here, I don't think, but the A920 up here is the opcodes that are being, that, that correspond to the, the, um, the text on the, on the right-hand side. So A920 is load A with the actual value of 32. So at the end of that instruction, we have A equals 32. The next one is a special... Um, load of an address. So this is load the contents of whatever is at memory address 70 in hex. And there is a special case opcode A5 here which says I'm only expecting the, the value to be in the bottom 256 bytes of memory. That is, I only need one byte to signify the address of the value that I'm loading. So that's kind of a a uh, an optimization if you like. And then this guy here, LDA1234, is loading from a anywhere in memory, but he has a different opcode, he's A9, AD, sorry, and then the, the uh, address takes two, two bytes. So there's already like this thing where we're, we're treating the first 256 bytes of RAM slightly differently. We've got like different opcodes to talk to those, which is important in a second. Uh, you can also index with an offset which comes from one of those two indexing registers. So, you know, the LDA, one, two, three, four, comma X or comma Y there allows me to effectively read memory of you know, one, two, three, four, plus whatever the X register currently is. That allows you to kind of loop backwards and forwards over RAM. And now we get to the real cool thing. This, this parens here says, okay, treat address 70 and implicitly address 71 as a 16-bit address, and then index via that. So 
Um, maybe it's better to explain it over here. So like this LDA 70 comma Y means read the address, read whatever's at 70, read whatever's at 71, stick them together to make a 16-bit address, and now index that with Y. So this is effectively like a pointer, the 70 and the 71. So the zero page, this, the, t the first 256 bytes of memory were called the zero page. The zero page could be think thought of as a kind of another 256 registers, registers as they're treated differently, and indeed in pairs they could be treated as a 16-bit pointer. So that's the only way you kind of could do pointer arithmetic without resorting to sort of self-modifying code tricks. And there are some other strange modes down the bottom here where you can index literally within the just the zero page or indirectly through a pointer in the zero page. But I've never actually seen anyone do this. In fact, I didn't even have this instruction written for ages until, until I found a game that used it. So uh, this is probably too much to go through, but there's a big old example here, especially when it's a, as dense as this and difficult to read. But this is my like string length routine. And yeah, we can perhaps go over it, or you can look at the slides later on. Otherwise, we're going to be here all day. Uh, unless anyone has any particular. Nope, we'll move on. So what does an emulator look like? I don't, I suppose I haven't really discussed what I did in JavaScript or anything general like that. I, guess, I suppose you've kind of just taken it as read that JavaScript is the correct language to write any low level emulation in, but never mind. Uh, so this is like a hypothetical main loop of the emulator here. I kind of set up the A, X, Y, S, and P sort of registers at the top here. Um, I'm, de I'm saying that there is, exists a function called read byte that returns whatever is in the, the address adder. And then um, I set my PC, my program counter, to be whatever's pointed to by FFFC and FFFD, which is the default state of when the processor turns on. It reads those two memory addresses and then jumps to that address effectively. That's how it kind of defines where the start address is. You'd think it would make much more sense just to start at zero and work up, but evidently not. And then we sit in a while loop, and we just get the next opcode, read by PC, PC++, and then we switch on it, and we go for each of the different types of opcode. We say, well, A9 encodes load A with an immediate value, so let's read in the A value from the pro where the next byte of the program counter increment it, and we're done. And so on for all the other instructions there. So, you know, transfer Y to A, A equals Y, we're done. Um, this indirect guy, the LDA XX, Y, is a bit more complicated because it involves that kind of double read from the zero page to get a new address, and then read from that address plus the Y register. Um, so you implement all of those, and you've got an emulator. Fantastic. Except we've glossed over a whole ton of stuff here, right? First of all, we're not setting any of those flags. Those flags like, um, uh, which I'll describe in a second, actually. I've got this out of order. Um, we're not setting any flags. The memory access, I've just written some function called readmem that I assume exists and returns some numbers based on whatever the memory is. Um, I haven't talked anything about the hardware. Presumably, we need to talk to hardware as well, virtual hardware in this instance. Uh, interrupts are very, very important and aren't handled by this. And I'm not handling time. And by handling time here, I'm that, that loop would just run as fast as your modern PC would let it go. Now, that obviously is not an accurate emulation of a 2 megahertz machine. So in some way, we need to account for how long each of those uh, instructions really took in terms of wall clock time and sort of synchronize everything up. And more importantly, when it comes to dealing with hardware, the hardware has certain performance characteristics. And in these machines, people would take advantage of that. So they would say, set flags to like read a, a, a certain amount from the, say, the disk controller. And then they wouldn't even wait for the interrupt. They would just do 300 cycles of useful work, and then they would read it, knowing that it would be done by then. So you have to make sure everything's sort of in step. <coughs> so the flags register is eight bits long. and has a carry zero, uh, this interrupt disable bit, which allows you to turn off the interrupts, uh, decimal, which puts it into binary coded decimal mode, which is a whole ridiculous, complicated uh, way of storing two um, ASCII digits effectively in one 8-bit um, value, and, and have the, the, the processor give you some support with that, so overflows and trans It's complicated, but very few games actually bother doing it, or games or any programs, so we, we won't really talk about that. Uh, the overflow flag and the negative flag. And then there is bit five and bit four there, which um, which were not actually used, but some games would take advantage of them. So you just need to sort of hang on to them. So uh, 
when do these flags get set? So the, the Z and the N flags get set on every single load or arithmetic operation. So it, anything we do and we get a new value out that we store to a register, we then set out whether it's zero or whether it's negative. The carry flag is only updated by shifts and arithmetic, and it's only ever read by arithmetic. Um, the overflow flag is only set by ar ar arithmetic, and the, the D, V, and C flags, the decimal ones, are, are controlled just by special instructions. So that's pretty easy. What do we look like now? So now, unfortunately, our code doesn't fit onto one screen, so I've only picked two instructions to sort of blow up and have a look at it. So let's have a look at the add with carry. Uh, now, now we've got a little bit more complicated. We read the value that we're going to be adding with, and if we have a carry from the previous operation, uh, if the, the carry flag is currently set, we're going to add an extra one to this. Then, um, then we need to make sure it fits back into eight bits. Bear in mind that JavaScript lets us put like floating point values up to like 64 bits worth of, of value, and then we we don't want that. And, and now we set the zero flag and the, the negative flag, and I'm using this sort of idiomatic double bang thing to turn the, the A into a bool. Uh, and likewise, whether the top bit of that 8-bit value is set controls whether or not we think we're negative or not. And then similarly with the load, the load doesn't have to worry about the, the carry flag here. He only has to worry about the value that he just loaded in. Is it zero or negative? So that's already getting a bit more complicated, but you know, still, we're still pretty cool. Memory. Now, we have 32K of RAM and 32K of ROM, but somewhere in the middle of that map lives the hardware, and the hardware masquerades as memory, but it isn't. It sort of snoops on the bus, and he reads or writes to particular magic addresses actually have significance to devices that live on the bus. So this is the memory map. Um, at the bottom here, so the bottom 32K lives, sorry, the bottom 32K of the address base is the RAM, two banks of 16K RAM. Then we have 16K of ROM, and this ROM is paged. What that means is you can have multiple ROM chips plugged into the computer, and then a, another hardware register somewhere switches which of those ROM chips appears in this block here. And in the instances of um, on the BBC Micro, this is where the basic interpreter would live, or in the case of when you're loading stuff off of disk, this is where the disk controlling logic would get swapped in. So you'd have, when you actually got your hard, hard disk, not hard disk, sorry, floppy disk unit, you would put a little extra ROM into the, this, onto the circuit board, which would be, have all of the disk controlling operations on it. And then whenever you did any disk operations, you'd have to switch out whatever was here, run them, and then switch back. And then the top, the last 16K has the, like, the operating system proper, which can't be paged. But in the middle of this, this page FE00, is 256 bytes of, sort of magic, um, not really memory, where if you write to it, depending on what um, address you're writing to, you're selecting and talking to a particular hardware device, and when you read from it, you're also reading from that device. Both of which of those can have side effects. Yes, Ajit. So the question was, am I using the actual ROMs machine? Yes, yes I am. Um, thankfully, due to the, loads of other people writing emulators for this, um, they're, they're pretty easy to find, and Judging from the number of people who have checked it into source control, uh, the actual ROM images, I'm fairly sure that Acorn are no longer asserting copyright over them, which is another issue. There are, uh, there's also like an online game archive that has a whole bunch of games, which has a quite a good takedown policy, and only one, um, only one publisher is bothering to actually uh, tell them to take, take down stuff, which is just hilarious to think like a 30-year-old game, someone still cares about it. Whereas what I've discovered through, through this, which now going off topic a bit, is that as I was getting sort of nearer and nearer to like perfect emulation of all of the cycles, I was, uh, I was encountering games that would or would not run. And most of the, the, the top end games would use every single trick in the book to kind of eke out performance or, or more, more often they would have um, protection systems like copy protection systems or hack protection systems, which would be... Um, where they like encrypt the main game code, and then the decryption routines would use all sorts of crazy hardware characteristics as they were going to generate the keys to decrypt the whole code, so that if you had like a, a, a breakpointing system on the on the outside, you, there was no way you could stop the whole machine and then get it to start back up again without it um, like one of the things becoming desynchronized. You know, like like it, um, you'd have something which is like every time there's a, a vertical uh, TV interrupt, then increment a number and use that as part of the um, 
the decryption code, which meant obviously if you slowed it down at all, the, number, the TV interrupts would continue going and your encryption key would go wrong, which means you couldn't like, crack the code. So anyway, it, there were some real challenges in getting it so accurate that it would decode all these things. And I, luckily, I was actually able to get in contact with most of the authors of the games who were still interested in this kind of stuff. And um, they were able to help me like, decode their old code. And in fact, I got permission. My unit test, one of my unit tests is to dec decrypt about five different games by a particular author, Kevin Edwards, who was the master of this kind of stuff. And he's given me permission to actually put this in as like my, my checked in unit tests. So um, yeah, anyway, slides aside there. Uh, OK, so let's have a quick look at what read mem and write mem might look like. Um, so we have our RAM is 32Ks worth of a uint8 array. So I'm using the typed arrays that JavaScript now has. This came in with the WebGL stuff. Um, and they're very, very, they're so very, very performant. I can't believe I was about to say that. They're more performant than a general purpose array. And they also have a nice side effect of if we're reading and writing to them, they're going to automatically truncate it to be eight bits. So I don't have to worry about anding with FF the whole time, every time I'm writing to it. Um, and you know, we've, so we've got our RAM there. I'm assuming there's some function called load, which is going to return uh, a 16K blob of um, data from somewhere. So I'm loading the operating system and in this var oz. And then ROMs here is the array of up to 16 different swappable ROMs that can live in that third section of RAM. And by default, the, the last guy, the, the ROM 15, uh, is the basic ROM. So I'd load that into that slot. Uh, so that's kind of my setup code. And then my read mem looks like this. You know, it's just a simple switch across the addresses saying, well, if it's less than the 32K boundary, it just maps directly into the RAM. Cool, we're done. If it's less than the um, swappable area of ROM, well then, now I need to go through this ROM select register, which is the hardware register that determines which of those ROMs is currently active. And then I indirect through him, and then I look into his ROM at the relevant address. And then if it's uh, inside that special magic seek uh, area, FE00 to FF00, I'm going to read hardware, which again, I'm punting on for now. Otherwise, I return the operating system um, ROM. So pretty simple there. Likewise, write mem just says, if it's less than the top of, the, of memory, put it in there. Uh, if it's inside the magic hardware area, I need to write to hardware. Otherwise, we ignore it, because writing to ROM doesn't do anything. Cool. We're going to go over a couple of the bits of the hardware here, just to give you a, a sort of a broad overview. Uh, there's the keyboard. We've got um, two separate input-output processors. Processors is too strong a word. It's, uh, input-output um, chips that uh, have like a bunch of timers on them and also can control peripherals in a, way, in a way, like clocking things in and out with serial to parallel conversions and stuff. And then there's the video circuitry. So yeah, this wasn't going to come out even on my laptop. But this is the circuit diagram of the keyboard, which has been one of the more useful things to have around while writing this. What you can't quite see here is that up the top there is one chip, one of those original chips when I showed you the big, great, big um, uh, motherboard of, the, of this thing. One of those is, can be easily tied to which uh, one of the chips on the motherboard. There's, uh, where's the other one? This one here. This is another chip here. And this is one here as well. And then this guy here is just literally an array of wires with uh, switches on them. And so when you're reading and writing the keyboard, you're, what you're really doing is looking at this great big matrix of things. Um, these are like comparators at the top, and you can choose what what uh, of the sorry not current comparators what are they demultiplexers. So there is a four bit um, input here, and then depending on the value of that four bit, then one of these rows here, or sorry, one of these columns, is brought logic high, and then this chap down here is usually emitting all of all eight um, things are powered. Um, but you can configure it after to, to be any one of them also. But uh, the output of this is then goes through this OR gate, which comes back out round to an input, which can be configured to generate an interrupt. So when you're typing on the keyboard normally, oh, I seem to have lost that. This guy up here is set to be in a mode where he counts up to 13 over and over again, which causes each one of these lines in turn to be very, very quickly strobed between. This guy is, is configured to output all ones. So all of these guys are, 
are high. They're then ORed together, and if you're pressing any key, very, very quickly, the processor gets interrupted. So that's cool. Then you need to know which key it was. And that's where you turn off the strobing that this guy's doing, and you energize one of these at a time until you find the column that the key that was being pressed is on. Then having found that column, you turn this guy off, and you go down one row at a time until you find the one that's on. And so that's how the keyboard is working under the hood. Um, and all of it comes back through this just one output here where you've just got one thing that tells you, um, are, are we on, is this, is this key down or not? So there's quite a lot of finesse in what's going on there in terms of even just getting the keyboard to work. Uh, yes, that's probably all I need to say on that. It's more complicated than, than I thought. Yeah, so there's a little bit of studio code, I think. I described it relatively easily. Then, this is like the, the, the block diagram of one of the two uh, interface adapters, the, the two I.O. chips that are on there. It's got uh, a bunch of control registers. It's got two timers. Uh, for some reason, this segment is not on this picture, which is in the hardware. And um, uh, those timers can be used to uh, just count down and generate an interrupt when they get to zero, or just count, or count down, generate an interrupt to zero, and then reload back up to a particular value again. So at that point, they can kind of generate an interrupt every n cycles, which is useful for like timing, like keyboard repeat rates and things. I think the operating system used them for. Uh, and in addition to that, it also has uh, two, two I.O. ports, which actually then uh, break out onto the rest of the board. Some of these were actually physically accessible on the outside. For the, so, so one of these two chips was the user uh, input-output adapter, and that's the one that had like access to these programmable I.O. pins I was talking about. And one of them is a system one, where each of these guys then talks to things like, for example, the keyboard. So that port A actually comes out here. The, this is port A, and this is port B. So that's how you talk to the keyboard. You talk through this I.O. device and say, hey, can you output your pins in this particular way, which configures the next chip on in a particular way. And the bidirectional, so you can also read back from them. Uh, there's a shift register, which allows you to do some sort of serial communications as well. But uh, I think that's probably enough on that. Uh, yes. The trick with this guy is that th this guy only works at one megahertz. So there is a bit of circuitry that effectively declocks the 6502 when it notices that you're accessing memory that's in this range. And the 6502 is, is thankfully very, very, um, it doesn't care about the clock's speed itself. It's just as long as the clock's, when the clock ticks, it does something. So you can arbitrarily slow it down by just pulling, not, not, bring, not ticking the clock anymore. Um, this turned out to be the most difficult part of emulating because the, the subtlety about when within an instruction, um, you talk to this one megahertz bus, controls when you, your, the, the processor goes from running at two megahertz to one megahertz, which then puts the timings on or off, depending on whether they were the, the cycles were even or odd. If you think about it, it's like it's skipping every other cycle. Um, but before it did that, it had to synchronize the two clocks up so they would both be high. And depending on whether or not you're on an even cycle or an odd cycle, that would mean you'd either wait for like one or one or two of your clock cycles, which could be mean a big difference in terms of the timing somewhere along that line. I, I failed fail to explain it very well. It's very difficult anyway. Getting this right was, was the, the biggest challenge. Um, I think I've said about what, what, the, um, what they do. So let's move on. Right, so this is what one of the timer looks like. So um, this function would be called like every single, C, uh, every single, every other, excuse me, CPU cycle to emulate the fact that this guy runs at one megahertz. And effectively, it's just doing a bit of accounting and uh, counting down. And as and when we reach um, the, the point where the, the timer would fire, which is paradoxically not zero, it's actually, it, it allows to count itself three steps underneath before it actually fires, which is another thing. Unless you read the data sheet really, really carefully, you'd just be going, well, it's a, it's a counter. You put 10 in it, it ticks 10 times, and it generates an interrupt, surely. No, no, it's 13 times. Except when it re-enables re itself, and then it, then it um, adds an extra one on for no good reason. So the first time, it'll be 10, and then it'll be 9. And like, oh, sorry, the first time, it'll be 13, and then it'll be 12. And again, you'd be surprised how many things don't work if you don't emulate this stuff. So you can see what it's doing. It's just kind of counting down, and if the right conditions are met, it'll generate an interrupt on the CPU. Uh, the video interface. 
video, um, the video circuitry shares the RAM with the CPU. They did, they did a clever trick here. So the RAM actually can run at four megahertz. Woo and every other cycle, so on the, on the, the, the leading edge of the, the 6502, the 6502 could talk to the RAM, and on its falling edge, the video circuitry was allowed to talk to RAM. So RAM was flipping every other cycle between the two devices, so there was no kind of slowdown. Some of the machines around the time would have like RAM that was contended where you'd have to fight with the video circuitry to get access to it, and uncontended RAM, which was faster. Somehow they managed to get this to work um, at four megahertz, and it, it, it um, yes, you didn't have to suffer from that slowdown. So you share RAM with the CPU. Uh, the video chip itself has 12 internal registers, and uh, which control things like where, where in memory the screen address is stored, how many colors there are, how wide is it, it is, uh, how fast it should be outputting color information to the TV circuitry, which controls effectively the res resolution. Um, and some other things to do with like when the V blank is generated and when the, the color burst, which tells the TV that it's the beginning of the next top screen is happening. Um, the cool thing about this is that people would take advantage of that even. <laughs> so there is one game where deliberately the game would configure the, the, the sort of the cycle of when the pulse was generated for the TV it would configure it to be like just over 50 hertz, so which is 60 hertz in your country, of course. Um, so I, it stretched a frame slightly beyond what it should be. Now the TV would adjust by effectively scrolling the screen up as it was trying to latch a 50 hertz signal, but it was actually like 51 hertz. That would cause the screen to start rolling upwards and in a really beautiful, smooth way. And then the game would then generate color interrupts at particular points and blank the colors, to all, so all the colors to be black. And it would do that at the exact opposite rate that the screen was slowly processing upwards. So you wouldn't be able to tell that that was what was happening. But what would, what would appear to happen is the great game had this beautiful, slow, totally impossible to achieve through any other uh, way, uh, vertical scrolling. And behind the scenes, what's really happening is your TV is going, what the hell's going on here? And then it's being kind of like color bo boxed. And then obviously at certain points, it would reach a point where you would start seeing the bottom of the screen coming up. And at that point, you would have to latch back down again and kind of let them move everything down so that it kind of looks like a continuous move movement. But what things, the, 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 the lengths people went to is incredible. And I believe, I believe I support that. I believe I support that. I can't actually remember which game it was. I think it was Firetrack, which does seem to work. But uh, yes. So uh, yeah, I, I will talk. The, the, the video stuff is, is probably an entire lecture for itself, and I'm already way behind what I was meant to be. So let's talk a bit about the timings. Um, so as I said, it's a two megahertz clock. So all I need to do is ensure that I'm doing two million of those every second, and we're golden. Each instruction takes different amount of time. So this one takes two, this one takes three, this takes four, this one takes four, either five or six, and this one takes seven. And uh, the interrupts are checked at the end of each instruction. So. When I'm now in my LDA 42, I would like bump my time forward by two cycles, and then I would check to see whether or not an interrupt had been generated. And if so, I would jump off to the interrupt handler, and we'll be done. Cool. So it's never that easy, of course. All oh, right, no shit. Ah, oh, damn, I've gone past it. So now, now anyway, the code looks like this. So we've got a lot more complicated stuff going on. And oh, yes. It has, sorry. Um, so here we are. I've done the LDA XX, Y. So this is this indirect load. This one is one of the ones that takes either five or six. And the reason it takes either five or six is because it has to do a carry check itself. So it's it taking a 16-bit address and adding an 8-bit offset to it. Now, if the bottom eight bits overflow, it takes it one more cycle to add one to the next highest guy. But as an optimization, if it didn't carry, it just it does the read there and then. So that's when it takes five cycles, which is the common case, you hope. You, you know, you'd be sensible enough to like read um, so that you didn't cross a page boundary. If you do, you pay another um, clock cycle. Fair enough. So, so here we go. We're reading it in. We're doing some stuff. I, I work out what the address is if it, if it hadn't been carried with, with a bit of crazy arithmetic. And then if the address that we want to read from is not the exact same one as the non-carried address, then I'm going to take six cycles instead of five. 
And then at the end of the instruction, so obviously all the other switch cases will be in here, we say, if we've been asked to generate an interrupt and the processor's interrupt enable flag is, is not, sorry, interrupt disable flag, I've got this the wrong way around. Yeah, no, I know, yeah. If the interrupt disable flag in the processor is not false, then I can, I have to change my PC to go to wherever the interrupt handler is. So the next instruction will then be fixed, fetched from where the interrupt handler is. But as ever, it's more complicated than that. Uh, I think I sort of alluded to this before. So if I do it that way, then what, what's happening is that I'm effectively pretending that all of those reads and writes to the hardware device, or to, to, to memory, which could be a hardware device, happen at the beginning of the instruction. And at the end, I account for the six or seven cycles it could be. But actually, what's happened is time has passed even as the instruction was executing. So the mid-instruction mid reads, so like when you do a load, load with uh, a memory address, the first three cycles are reading the opcode, reading the low byte of the address that we want to read from, reading the high byte of the address we want to read from. Now we've got a 16 byte address, 16 bit address. Now the fourth cycle is the reading from the actual memory address that was asked for. So if that address happens to be a hardware device, the hardware device will actually see it four cycles after the CPU started executing the instruction, which is important. We've got multiple reads and redundant writes. The 6502 is a, pr a full processor, as we've seen, built out of only 3,501 transistors. It's staggering, an amazing achievement. The way they've been able to do that is by essentially tricking out the way that um, the hardware works. They, most CPUs of the time have, and, and now, have like a separate bus message which says, I would like to read or I would like to write to memory. Then they have like a whole bunch of address lines and they have a whole bunch of uh, data lines. And then they have an enable or a disable bit that says, I'm, I would like to talk to memory or I would not like to talk to memory. So you want to read from memory, you assert the I'd like to talk to memory, you assert, assert the read pin and you put the right address on and then at the end of the cycle you look on your data lines and you've got your memory back. Great. Uh, to reduce the complexity of the chip, they got rid of the data enable line, which means that every single cycle unconditionally, 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 the 6502 is accessing memory. Like the address lines are always valid. The RAM controller is always being accessed regardless. Um, this is cool because it saves a pin on the package, which is good. It saves a bunch of circuitry on the, the chip itself to do that kind of arbitration. But it means that if the instruction doesn't really care about reading from memory, it's going to read from somewhere all the time, which is, again, cool. But if it's a hardware device, that has meaning. It also has a redundant write. So in some cases, so oh, well, I suppose, let me, let's, go back to, let's go back to our example over here when we were looking at the overflow, which was either five or six. Ah, oh, pants, I've gone too far. Uh, one more, there we go. So here. When the processor is doing the add with carry, what's really happening is it's going first cycle read the opcode load, second and third cycle is read the address, fourth cycle is compute the offset by adding on the, no, that's not true, tell a lie. Right, so first cycle is read the opcode, second cycle is read the low byte, third cycle is read the high byte and have and also simultaneously having added the, um, the offset to the low byte. So we've done that together. So now we've got an address which hasn't been carried. On the fourth cycle, it's gonna read from that address. And if there was a carry, it's gonna do another cycle which is gonna correct it uh, and uh, update the address and read from the correct address, which means that in the intermediate state, it read from the wrong area of memory, which obviously has no side effects in the 16-bit, sorry but in a 64K system where there is no kind of paging or anything like that. It just means that you read at the uncarried address first, and then you noticed that you did the wrong read, and you sort of corrected it on the next stage. But again, if that was a, if that was a hardware device, you actually tickled the hardware device. It saw that spurious read. And if it was a hardware device, it might have done something, but certainly it would have slowed the CPU down. Similarly, when we do writes, under some circumstances, the calculation that it's done before it does the write, it may also have to like this correction set where it writes the unmodified value first and then it writes the modified value the second time. Uh, multiple redundant, redundant writes, yep. And then there's another thing. 
the, the 6502, despite being only 3,000 um, transistors, had very, very primitive pipelining such that it had already determined which address to fetch the next instruction from by the penultimate cycle. So if you take seven cycles, on the sixth cycle, it's where it's already checked the IRQ pin and decided where it's going to fetch the next opcode from. So if an interrupt happens on that last cycle, you miss it and you do the next instruction before you actually take the, um, you take the interrupt. And again, people would take advantage of this. It's particularly in interrupt handlers where it was almost needed because you would enable uh, interrupts in the end of your interrupt handler, and then you would do a return. And what you really don't want to do is have the return if you've already got an interrupt pending, return not get run, because you go effectively, the instant you re-enable interrupts, you'll go back to the beginning of the interrupt handler, but you haven't popped the stack, and you've only got 256 bytes of stack, so in the situation where you've got hundreds of interrupts happening, you would overflow 256 byte stack. But by having the, uh, the, the interrupt disable instruction effectively not take effect until the next instruction again, you would have returned, and then it would have popped the stack. I'm kind of, uh, yes, and the, we've talked about cycle stretching, which is the thing where it slows down. And there's definitely too much to cover here, although I've tried to do it. Um, so there's a whole bunch of other things to think about. So let's, let's briefly talk about what, how the actual implementation works. So there are obviously many similar opcodes. Um, the addressing modes are similar as well. So an LDA with an indirected through Y is effectively the same as an LDX of indirected through Y, except that you just read from a different place. and, and you, Put, put it in a different register. So writing 256 combinations of very complicated instructions is just not my, my style. So, so I've got a disassembly table, which is like for each instruction, this is the, 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 the text of that instruction. And I actually use the disassembly table as a hint to a, an, an instruction compiler, which looks at it and goes, OK, it's an ink. I know how to do an ink. What do I need to increment? OK, well, let's, let's look at the code for an absolute plus X register. OK, now increment that. And so now I can put the two halves together and can create the combinations and permutations without too much coding. Um, what does it look like? So there's the op part, which is the left-hand side, the op code. And I have a little function which returns just a structure that describes the work that needs to be done for each of the op types. So a knock is empty. LDA says, put into the CPU's A register this reg, where reg is going to be whatever the addressing mode has decided that it's going to be. And then we're going to set the 0 and n flags based on whatever that value was. And the little hint here saying, I need to access memory. I need, I'm going to do a read operation, which is uh, useful for some of the other things that the addressing mode stuff needs. Um, similarly, like storing A is like, I need to do a write here. And all I need to do is I need to put whatever value I want written into this reg value. Um, and then an increment, for example, here is one of the ones that does a read and a write. So if you're, if you're incrementing memory, for example, it reads the memory and then writes the memory back. Um, that's one of those examples where um, the old value is written before the updated value is written. So you read like 100, you would then write 100, and then you would write 101. You're like, <laughs> Seems stupid, but that's the way it goes. Um, right, and so you can do that for all the different types. There's only like 40 or 50 of those guys. And then there's, for each of the different addressing modes, there's another block of code that determines how that reg value gets used. And I, I have a little class called the instruction gen, which I'll talk about in a second. But effectively, that's the guy that I t tell what I'm doing. So in the instance of an abs mode, I know that. Um, any instruction that has an absolute address only is three bytes long. So that there's going to be three cycles to read the opcode, to read the low byte, and to read the high byte. So I'm already, I've moved forward three ticks in time. So I tell the instruction generator, hey, move forward three ticks in time. Then I say, OK, now I'm going to read a two byte address. Now, this isn't, if the, for those following closely, that's not actually tr strictly true, because really those reads happened at tick two and tick three, rather than both of them at tick three. But I'm making the optimization here that, that no, nobody executes code out of where the hardware registers are, which would just be insane. Uh, so that's a, a micro-optimization there. Um, and then if the op that's needed requires a read, I'm going to do a read operation now at whatever that address is. Um, and if it's a write, if, it, if it's a read and a write, this is where I'm going to do this spurious write. I happen to know that it's going to write the unconditionally write the same value out. This read op and write op are aware of where we are in the sort of the tick stream, and they will, will automatically tick more time forward depending on whether or not it's one of these 
um, slow areas of memory or a fast area of memory. So that's our read and our write, our spurious write done. We then get that op which came from the actual instruction type. So in the case of the ink, that would be the reg equals reg plus one. And then if it's got a write, oh, and I've missed a parent here, um, we'll actually write it back out again. And then we render the instruction. And we'll talk about what rendering is in a second if it's going to go to the next slide. Hello? Oh, there we are. So the instruction generator knows about these weird memory rules. And it schedules the ticks um, which, and, and optimizes. What it means is it's got a list of where in that sort of seven cycles that last instruction was, or up to seven cycles, where all of the important reads and writes to memory happen. And anywhere where there are unimportant memory reads, like for example, if you're reading and it can prove that the memory address is below uh, the 256 byte limit, or it's on the stack only, I know that there's no hardware map there, so it doesn't matter when I read or write to it. So I can kind of bunch up those things together, and I generate like contiguous runs of ticks, time ticks, where um, I don't have to update the whole state of the world. So in the case of uh, uh, the increment you saw there, that first uh, ig.tick3 means I can just fast forward time by three cycles before I touch memory. So anything that, um, anything that cares about time will be fast forwarded by three rather than being ticked individually three times, which is a lot faster when you're, you're, you're implementing this stuff. Um, then I'll issue the read. Now the hardware state has been updated to where it would be when that read would happen. And then I'll do some work after that. And the work after that, again, hopefully can just be fast forwarded through. And I hope in, in future to actually do much more fast forwarding where I can accumulate times where I haven't looked at the hardware and it doesn't really matter what's happening. So hopefully like 100 or 200 cycles can pass before I go and now poke to hardware. And so I'm like, whoop, okay, go back to the hardware, fast forward the hardware through 200 cycles worth of work, which is obviously much more efficient than picking it one at a time. And the output of the instruction generator is a piece of text, which is JavaScript source, which I then eval to make a function. And I've got a little function which does that particular opcode with all of this framework stuff built in and those optimizations put in. So this is what Ink Absolute looks like once it's come out of the, um, the optimizer. Uh, so in this instance, for example, it knew that uh, we did three ticks to get to the address read. And it must have, uh, well, I don't know why it's got four there. I must have missed something there. But um, this four, this one, and this one here are like the, the three points in the instruction where in, conceivably it could be talking to hardware. So the time needs to be accurate at that point. Um, yeah, and it's obviously auto-generated from all the crappy things like the reg equals zero or zero, which is just my way of trying to say to it, this is an integer zero rather than anything else. I, I'm not even sure if that makes a difference. But uh, Oh, the other thing the instruction gen done is it, it does is it, it knows where the penultimate cycle will lie. And so it inserts the check for interrupts at the relevant point in time within that instruction. Uh, so there, in this case, it's there because there is one more tick that's going to happen over at that point. Cool. OK. Emulating the video, we're already almost out of time. But effectively, it's a co-routine with the processor. Every single tick, I also tick the, um, uh, the video circuitry. So every time that you saw that whole time, where was it? Oh, crap. This CPU dot poll time adder or CPU dot, uh, you know, they're all poll time adders. That one there says, by the way, can you tick anything else that needs to go forward by, in time by, by four CPU cycles? So in the instance of that, that would tick the video four times. Each clock cycle reads one byte of RAM. Like I said, it's always like, sharing the, the bus with, with the, uh, the CPU. And it generates eight TV pixels based on all sorts of various settings that are in there. And the only other thing it does is it generates an interrupt at the top of the screen. Uh, so, yeah, it looks something like this. It's not really a, worth going into that, but yeah, it's just outputting um, stuff. But yeah, the image processing, yeah, the real, the real BBC Micro was almost always connected into a television rather than a monitor. So it had this beautiful fuzzy screen look. So uh, I actually out have a perfect screen representation of what it should look like, and then I deliberately use uh, like canvas things to upscale it by a non-integer number of pixels to get sort of the bilinear um, scaling artifacts, which makes it look like a blurry TV. Uh, and I need to do interlacing. Uh, the sound chip is the same chip that was in the Sega Master System. So I just literally copied over and pasted that code in, and it just worked, which was wonderful. And it's just another co-routine. Every single CPU tick, I go and fill in some more bytes of like sound audio output 
which means that you know it's got a very high fidelity. Whereas on the, the master system, I, I did it like 100 or 200 cycles at a time is where I was time slicing between each routine. Because I've had to do this high accuracy thing for the video and for other uh, hardware elements, I actually tick the sound chip at the, uh, at the CPU cycle level accuracy. That has a nice side effect of meaning things like sampled speech, where CPU would be set in a tight loop, just turning the volume up and down really quickly. Works absolutely spot on. Live demo, OK, this is what we've been basically waiting for, I think, although you've probably all seen this anyway. So I don't know if I should. Hello? This is looking extremely ill. I don't know quite what's going on here. I think I'm going to take that out and rely on the Wi-Fi. There we go. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Hooray! Oh, there's the sound stuttering at startup. So, let's just full screen it. So this is what you were presented with when you turned on your BBC Micro for the first time. So it's so exciting to see this because obviously the first thing you did was this. Woo! Um, the default image on this guy is um, disk image is Elite, the game that we saw earlier. So we might as well boot that up and at least have a look at it. So I can exp while we're while we're going here, right? Um, the disk drive actually loads a little bit faster than real time. Reload it again. Just watch down here while it goes. Oh, you can't see it now, but you can see this flickering pixel here and the strange artifacts that are going on here. So at the top half of the screen, well, top three, two, two thirds, three quarters of the screen, this is a two color mode. And at this point, those interrupts generators that are inside the count the timer chips have been configured to generate an interrupt when the, the, the TV is known to be about here or actually when the TV is here as it, you've got a bit of time while it traces back around and comes over to here and at that point it's updating almost all of the hardware registers inside the the video circuitry to say hey go into four color mode now and change your your color table to look like this and change all these other bits and pieces around so that then we can have a display at the bottom part which has four colors but this is a lower resolution and you can see, it, unfortunately, it's not fast enough to do it before the, the, the raster beam has actually made it there. So you can see these kind of alternate coloring line things going on on this blob here and this blob here. So this blob here is because it didn't um, update the, the width of a pixel, or rather it updated the width of a pixel slightly too soon. So now the pixels are twice as wide here and, and red, apparently. So um, that's not to belittle this amazing thing here, which is like we're rendering a... a, 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 a a 3D model here, completely using 8-bit arithmetic with no multiplier or anything like that. And so the, and the lines are being drawn in software. It's, it's a marvel. Uh, let's not load a new commander. But let's, uh, so there was a trading part for this as well. So you can go and see what the prices are on this particular planet. Here's the data. The, the legend is, and I need to check with the guys. I'm now in contact with him, that this whole game came about because they made a random number generator. And it was fun for them to invent um, like a trading game based on the random number generator, which could generate text like this, like a sort of, uh, um, uh, what do they call it? Thank you, Markov chain type stuff. So Lave, which is the default plan, is most famous for its vast rainforest and the Lavian tree grub. Cool. Uh, so all this is generated, there's, there's no way to store all this stuff. So it's just a seeded random number generator with particular seeds for each thing. And uh, yeah, and then what do we do here? Well, let's go and find the right button here. So this is like the local star system. Here's the ga galaxy, the entire galaxy that I'm in, and there's you know, as far as I can hyperspace. So let's go and let's go go to Zeance. That was always my favourite. And we can get the data on Zeance. Okay, so Zeance is a corporate state, which is safe to go to. The other guys are like feudal systems, very lots of pirates there, so we should be should be safe going here. But of course, Zeance is a tedious place. It's a shame. So let's launch. Uh, no, I don't want to buy anything. Ah, oh, crap! Wrong button. So you'd presumably fill up your, your cargo with all of these kind of things, and then you would go, and we'd be out into the wide world. So let me just spin around, and you can see where we've just come out of, which is where the screenshot came from. 
So that's the space station I just came out of. Now, the, the, the thing about this was that the, you do all this work to get to a new place, and then you'd have to dock with the damn space station. And it was so brutal about letting you in or not that often as not, you'd get there by the skin of your teeth, and then you'd crash into the bloody space station after two hours of like, fighting. So that's, uh, notice the counter ticks down far from you. And you see the, um, the, the three uh -oh, were being attacked. Whoa, this is witch space. This never happens. This is ultra rare, guys. Those are Thargoids. Those are like, they can uh, catch you even in hyperspace and now we're dead. All right. Brutal. Like all games of this generation. Absolutely brutal. So, uh, yeah, dead. And uh, you want to load again? It's like, oh, yeah, I guess so. You imagine playing this on tape. Like you'd have to rewind the tape to record and load back where you were previously or save it and hope that it hadn't been corrupted. It's dreadful. Uh, okay, let's let's go very quickly over and load. Oh, the mouse pointer is really laggy on this that screen. Hello, no, I, I know I've gone full screen. I want to get to my little option. There it is. So one of the things I put in was support for talking to the, well, this this archive. Uh, so, I, which which led me down an interesting garden path. So the, the, the particular archive that these games are stored in, they're all stored as zip files, and there's no native JavaScript zip file support, so I had to find a library which did it, which turned out to have a bug, and it took me like three days to diagnose and fix the bug in the JavaScript ungzip. Fun and games. Okay, come on, load, load, load. So this is the absolute pinnacle game that I was talking about before, and if you crash, I'm going to be upset. Oh, good. Uh, let's go. May I use your sideways RAM? Yes, you may. So side, I, the thing I glossed over is that uh, that, that um, RAM, so the ROM bank, the, the third one that could be swapped out, you could also swap in some RAM. Check out the sample speech, guys. So, oh, come on. I apparently have lost keyboard input. Bollocks. Let's try that again. One last time, and otherwise we'd just have to play it for, my, for yourself and take my my uh, my. Take it as read that it is actually an awesome game. I really want to complete this again. Come on! All right, now today, today I can't move around, and I wonder why that is. I can apparently pan the screen around, but we can't do anything else. Do those work? Yeah. It's just my movement. Utterly weird. Maybe I've broken something. <laughs> um, but that's an amazing game, and you'll just have to take my word for it. So, um, there's literally hundreds of games for this, as you can imagine. There's loads of exciting and interesting things, and I wasn't really sure what I was going to go with this particular live demo, but it's there. Um, I guess what I could show you is what I'm... Oh, yeah, there's the debugger. This is the single most important thing if you're writing an emulator, is to have a shit-hot debugger inside of it. So... Um, I can stop it at any time with the, with the home key, and yeah, you can't quite see it, can you? But here is a disassembly of where we currently are. Here are those registers, the flags register, the AXYS program counter. Here's like an arbitrary memory dump that you can move around. This, this is the configuration of those two input-output devices up here. And I can obviously single step through um, the codes, and you can see all the, 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 um, the dudes here are updating the program counter. I can also set breakpoints. Um, although actually my break, breakpoint API is usually the JavaScript thing because effectively every single um, every single cycle I call a function if it exists, and that means I can put an arbitrary function in and sort of have a, a breakpoint that does anything I want it to do. Which is when I'm debugging it, I'm like, okay, if this register is this and that's happened and it's more than this long since the thing started, then breakpoint. Uh, what else have we got? Oh yeah, we can go up and down the stack, and there's, these are all hyperlinks, which is which is nice. So we can go to them. Anyway, so that's that bit. Um, and then what is, the, I guess I can just very quickly show you the thing I've most, most recently been working on, which will involve me going to an even more, potentially even more broken version of it, which is this one. Beep. So I added in tape support, which, uh, which was more difficult than I thought it would be. Oh, that's stupid. But at least I bothered to put the sound of the tape loaded in as well. Can you imagine loading a game like this again? I don't know how. Yeah, let's let's do that to save Oliver's ears. But the patience of 
of our generation. I don't know if like, my children would not sit through three and a half minutes or four minutes to load the title page of the game that then sub subsequently loads afterwards. But... Uh, yeah. <laughs> you make a very good point, yeah. One thing that I need to put in, actually, which some of the other emulators do, is they have disk drive noise so that when you're loading off the disk, you can hear that it's doing something. At the moment, there's just a little light down at the bottom, which isn't actually on the screen. Uh, anyway, let's, let's get to the end of this quickly. So miscellaneous stuff. Um, I found a whole bunch of interesting things inside of the JavaScript system. If you have a switch statement that has 256 entries in it, Chrome goes, fuck this, and doesn't optimize it at all. But if you have an if statement which goes, if it's less than 128, switch the first 128 else, switch the second 128, then magically it decides to optimize it again. So, you know, that's the kind of stupid things you discover. I, I used to do dynamic dispatch for some of the hardware, so, you know, you would, I'd have a, effectively like a function pointer um, where I would swap the function pointer to be one of several different routines depending on whether or not hardware was configured in a particular way. You know, like the different screen modes, for example. Every time we switch the screen mode flag, I could point the render screen at a different routine, but that again confuses Chrome's optimizer. It goes, look, you keep switching what this function means. I can't inline it. I can't do anything with it. I'm giving up. So I just have the if statement in it now, and then the, the JIT itself learns that either it's always one particular thing or it's always another, and it de-optimizes it as it flicks backwards and forwards between them, which is pretty cool. My favorite um, optimization technique of old, loop unrolling, actually makes a very big difference. In the middle of the screen code, I actually unroll the eight pixel thing manually, and I try and fit them into one statement, so it's all got like sort of like the, you know, the thing that we were complaining about with C++ the other day is like, and the same is true of JavaScript, where you can increment like a, a value while you're using it. So you just like screen of px++ plus plus <laughs> equals convert pixel of converted pixel buffer plus equals eight, and all that kind of nonsense like that. So. And that made a big difference, because apparently it's only, it sees it as one statement. It knows that certain things can't change about it, presumably. Um, yeah, using the, the, the uint32 array for the screen and actually talking to it as 32-byte um, ARGBs makes a big difference, too. And so, so doing a conversion once, every time the palette is changed, every time the color palette is selected by the, 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 the emulator, doing the effort of now generating a huge, great big table of all the possible combinations and permutations of values that are being written to the screen into the 32-bit ARGB values that need to go onto the canvas is worth doing, um, just to make the screen code faster. Uh, the exact timing we've talked about, undocumented opcodes. Uh, so undocumented opcodes, the way that the, um, the, the opcodes were, were, were um, laid out were that different bits of the, the instruction number would correspond to energizing, selecting different areas of the processor's circuitry. So it turned out that, although it wasn't well-defined, if you happen to have an instruction which energized both the A register bit and the X register bit, you could do operations that use both registers at the same time, because they didn't care. So there were things like store A, sorry, load A and X at the same time because the, you'd take the load A opcode and then you'd sort of set the bit in that opcode that, that corresponds to the X register and you'd get a free read of two things, although it wasn't officially supported. It's just that the X register reading circuitry was also available. Um, similarly, there were like load and shifts. Store zero was another one where if you selected none of the registers. But um, the problem with those undocumented opcodes is that A, they're undocumented, so you don't know what they do um, unless you experiment heavily. Uh, but they also varied from between revisions of the, the processor as they changed layouts. And in fact, for the, the, the BBC Master, which was the, the device that came after the BBC Micro, uh, they used a different imprint of the 6502 completely, and tons of old games stopped working because they were obviously were taking advantage of these ridiculous instructions to do a little thing. And then this last link here is people are more crazy than me. Now, this site is amazing. This is a 6502. Some crazy guys have dipped a, a real-life 6502 in acid, eaten away all of the plastic circuitry, and taken loads and loads and loads of extremely high-resolution pictures of it under an electron, uh, well, under some kind of cool microscope. It's probably not an electron microscope. Then they've written image processing software to d infer where all the transistors were and all the connections between the transistors. And then they put it all together They've written a pretty simple, it fits on like two pages of screen, transistor logic emulator, not even logic, but like transistor level emulator, and then it actually runs. It runs like a 6502. This is a virtual 6502 where, if I start the process up here, uh, this emulator, so this is more actually far more of a simulator than you like. It highlights the areas that are currently high. 
So you can see, as I'm ticking through, various different parts of the uh, circuit are turning, uh, lighting up or not. And the very cool thing about this is that they've actually bothered to go through and work out what a lot of the internal points are. Oh, come on. Is that? Oh, yeah, there it is. Come on. And this is like a sampling of some of the internal points at each instruction or each cycle. And in, in this instance, they are actually showing the, the low and the high of the cycle, which I don't emulate properly. Um, that is, I don't discriminate between the, the, cycle, the clock going high and the clock going low, which effectively is at double the rate. So 4 megahertz is going high, low, high, low, high, low. Um, so you can see here, like LDY took two cycles, LDX took a cycle, two cycles as well, here's a ZP. So this was a, let me check out a lot of like when the actual things were happening. And th this is the data bus, this is the read-write pin. So all these are reads at the moment. Uh, if I were to like configure it up with the instruction, like the, one of those increment instructions which does the spurious write, you actually see it doing that spurious write of the unmodified value. It's awesome. The only thing it can't do is emulate like external circuitry that would, for example, tamper with the clock, which is exactly the circuitry that I had the biggest trouble getting to work. This this like the, the slowdown when we went to the um, a one megahertz circuitry. So I had to kind of infer that all myself. But thankfully, my crazy friend Richard um, knows of someone who still has a, a real life BBC. UCB, and he wrote a program to go through all the different permutations and combinations of like setting and flags, resetting flags, um, toggling hardware bits, generating interrupts, when, seeing how many cycles it took for the interrupt to happen. And um, then he got someone to run it, and they took a screen photograph of the screen. We typed in all of the values, and now the emulator agrees with every single sort of like how many cycles everything took. And it forms part of the tests set up as well. Um, let me see, is that it? I think that might be it. I hope, I hope for your sake it's it. Because <laughs> it's been going on wrong. All right, this is worth it, totally worth it. Uh, two reasons, two last stories. So when, when I was doing this, somebody on the sheep and cheese mailing list that some of us are on asked for um, or made some comment about like having a version of Elite with the rating. Your rating was like harmless, mostly harmless, dangerous, deadly, and then eventually become Elite, which was the, the, the game idea, and that was like based on how many times you shot other people down. Um, they wanted it to be like, I think it was shite, wasn't it? Yeah, rating shite. And someone mocked up a screen and sent a, a, a screenshot of someone like photoshopping in like an old version of, of Elite and putting the word shite in. And I thought, I can do better than that. I can send a link to a playable version where I've changed the names to be shite. So I went back into my, my old uh, hacking protection systems kind of mode and thought to myself, how hard can this be? Surely somewhere in memory there's going to be the string harmless that I'm going to replace with the word shite and we're done. No. I went on to a massive odyssey of hacking, uh, reverse engineering with the, the, the elite code and discovered that the text in the game was not only encrypted but was tokenized in a really unusual weird way. And when I finally worked it all out, I was able to patch it and send out the, uh, an update with a, a link to um, this uh, rating shite version, which also gives me like a URL parameter that you can actually hot patch code with, which is kind of cool. And, um, and I wrote a blog post on it saying, well, hey, this is, if anyone ever cares, this is how Elite renders its text. And I had previously been in contact with the um, author, one of the co-authors of Elite, and he had been somewhat standoffish, but I eventually, I sent, I sent him and said, hey, I don't know if you remember any of this stuff, but I think I've worked out how your, um, your code works back then. What do you know? Ha, ha, ha. And he replied, and he sent me this screen, this, this scan of the original piece of code, sort of piece of paper where they'd printed out and scribbled on, this is his handwriting, all of the different um, tokens and what they meant. And hilariously, uh, you can't read it up here, but I, in my little blog post, I derived pretty much the same names of all of the thing, these strange opcodes up here, which would like print out your name, print out uh, the current planet that's selected or whatever. And, but it was kind of a rewarding moment to have like one of those people you, you, you hold in high esteem send you something like that. And as I say, the second thing here, also finally hacked Lunar Jetman. Uh, as a kid, me and Richard were, so I grew up with Richard. Um, uh, we, 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 were, uh, we, we used to like hack games together. And we were defeated by one of these Kevin Edwards protection systems. We just couldn't do it. We had absolutely no idea how it was done. Uh, it, it was just... All of the techniques that we normally use to, to decrypt the code just wouldn't work. So normally these, these, these systems would use, like I said, this vertical blank timer, 
or they would configure some of the other timers to keep generating interrupts, and then every now and then they would exclusive all the code that they're decrypting with the current value of one of these timers, which is always changing. So you'd think, well, crikey, and how do you even derive that? But we used to hack them because they often used one of the two timers that could be stopped. So in principle, we, in our decoding routine, we would run bits of their code, or we sort of like selectively run bits of their code. Then when we needed to insert ourselves, we would stop the timer, rewind it back a little bit, as long as it took our, our, our code to do its work, and then we would return back to it, and it would carry on as if the timer was still in the right place. It would carry on decoding correctly, and so we could hack it. But Kevin's protection system used the unstoppable timer. He also had an interrupt handler that kept monkeying with other random values, and it would do stuff like enabling and disabling the interrupt thing back to back, which has, as I said, this strange effect of not really causing the interrupt to happen when you think it does. It happens another cycle later again. All these type of things, and and uh, so we never we never quite cracked it. And the only way we could think of at the time, as as a 14 year old boy, <laughs> was we have to write an emulator. And so we started writing a 6502 BBC Micro emulator on a BBC Micro in BBC Basic. And we got as far as it getting through the first stage of the decryption code before we fell over, because we didn't know anything about like the sub-cycle um, reads. We didn't know about the spurious reads and spurious writes. We had no idea how the one megahertz bus stretching actually worked. So it was doomed to failure. But I have now hacked Lunar Gem Man using JavaScript, so I am totally pumped by that. And there's a third thing, and shit, yeah, we're, we're already well over, but it is, after all, it's the fourth tomorrow, so no one's really working right. Um, we contacted Kevin Edwards and said, dude, how did you do that? How did you even do this stuff? I mean, it's not possible. You know, you must have had such deep knowledge of the system and all these things in order to be able to, you know, actually encrypt it to be decrypted. Uh, and to his credit, actually, Richard had, had, had an inkling that what, it, what the solution was, and he, he put it to Kevin and said, did you do this? And he did. And the answer is, the encryption system that he used um, at the end would jump to, would, would do a last check on a CRC, and then if it failed, it would jump to the, the operating system routine that cleared memory and reset the device. He had a patched version of the ROM, which didn't do that. So he swapped in a ROM, which didn't have the clear all memory part inside the operating system. So you had a, like an OS that, that didn't clear RAM on, on this, this jump. So when his code got to the end, it jumped out to a routine which just reset the device but left the memory intact. And the f that doesn't help you because it's an encryption routine, right? So it encrypts itself. You can't modify it because one of the inputs to the encryption routine is the routine itself. It modifies itself as it's going and it uses itself as the key. <laughs> so it's just totally insane and all these other hardware registers. So you can't fiddle with it. but um, Every time the CRC was wrong, it jumped off this thing area and, and would reset, but in his case, it didn't. But the, the class of ciphers that he used, or the encryption sort of technique, was a, a circular one. And after 256 iterations, it would decrypt back to the original. So he did this 255 times and then saved the result. And then that 256th time, the CRC would be correct it wouldn't jump to the clear the, root, clear the address routine, and that was the one that we put, put onto the disk. So uh, just staggering set of like m both sort of um, Galois fields, sort of arithmetic knowledge, and also like actual physical. No one would think to actually replace the ROM with something which didn't do what the ROM normally does. Uh, yeah, I think I'm well over. So thank you guys for listening. <laughs> and uh, you can by all means talk to me afterwards or whatever. And uh, thank you. Thanks. <laughs>